In Xanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran, through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground, with walls and towers were girdled round, and there were gardens bright with sinuous rills, where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree. And here there were forests ancient as the hills, enfolding sunny spots of greenery. Coleridge had never been to Mongolia, or to China, and he was writing this more than four centuries after the fall of Kublai's dynasty, the Great Yuan. Alf, the sacred river he's describing, has much more in common with the River X in Somerset County, in western England, than anything in the Far East. Coleridge, of course, conceived this poem in a dream, high on opium in Exmoor. It was awoken by his opium dealer, and in the process of that transaction, forgot most of the 300-line poem that the dream had given him, and struggled for weeks to re recreate a mere 54 of those lines, where it later went on to become one of the most famous poems in the English language. The real Xanadu had no sacred river. It had no caves, no chasms, or forests, or incense-burning trees. The, tr the sea was two or more days a ride away. But he may have been right about the pleasure domes. Kublai Khan did, after all, at the height of his power, have over 7,000 concubines. The man was perhaps the most powerful ruler to have ever lived. He was, at least nominally, the Kagan, or emperor, of the largest contiguous empire in history, stretching from Poland to Korea, Syria to Vietnam, one-fifth of the world's land mass, an area larger than the continent of Africa, perhaps half of all human beings alive at the time. Founded in 1206 when Temujin took the name Genghis Khan, the Mongol Empire expanded rapidly, moving east, west, and south with an unfathomable speed, devouring new territory with each passing day. The tactics used were outright annihilation, inspiring such a distraught terror in his enemies that they begged at his feet for unconditional surrender. Genghis Khan declared himself a punishment sent from God, and, alleged, and is alleged to have said, The greatest happiness t is to vanquish your enemy, to drive him before you, to see his cities reduced to ashes, to see those dear to him bathed in tears, and to clasp to your bosom his wives and daughters. Three Chinese dynasties were extinguished under their conquests. The Xixia practically erased from history. Whole cities in the Middle East remain barren and desolate to this day. They did what neither Napoleon nor Hitler could do, and conquered Russia, then utterly trounced the Knights Templar and the Teutonic Knights in Eastern Europe, such that the King of France had reported to him that nothing would stop them from reaching the Atlantic. The Mongols were, in many ways, the very personification of barbarism. But they weren't the first. 800 years before, another barbarian named himself Flagellum Dei, the Scourge of God. Attila the Hun, the man before whom Rome trembled, was also a steppe nomad, and is likely descendant from the Xiongnu out of Mongolia. It's sometimes said that Rome fell because China built a wall. And although that's a gross oversimplification, it's, it is true that the aggressive politics of the Han Dynasty drove the Xiongnu westward, where they eventually bulldozed into the other grand, decadent empire at the other end of the continent. In the 14th century, perhaps the bloodiest of them all would come to power in what is now Uzbekistan, trying to recreate the great Mongol empire of Genghis Khan. His name was Tamerlane, and he would decimate entire civilizations to dust, leaving towers of human skulls, 60, 70, 80, 90,000 to a pile. When he died, a warning was carved into his mausoleum that whosoever disturb his sleep shall face an invader more terrible than he. His coffin was finally opened by a Soviet archaeologist on June 20th, 1941, just two days before the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. In the first half of the 21st century, as the world is ravaged by economic collapse and energy crisis, Harijan comes to power in Mongolia. He ousts the democratic government and creates a new warlord state, and surges outwards in it to an unsuspecting and unprepared world. This is the premise of my new novel, The Hounds of Harijan. London, Paris, and The Hague are obliterated with nuclear warheads because the President of the Council of Europe refused to surrender in person. The Secretary General of the United Nations is buried up to her neck in sand, doused in honey, and eaten alive by fire ants. Beijing is demolished such that no two bricks remain mortared together, and they bring in thousands of wolves from Siberia to tread upon the ground so that the ruins will disappear from history forever. This is the end of the modern era, and Harijan's epoch begins. The novel takes place about a hundred years from now, now into the third, fourth, and fifth generation after Harijan in Australia. Harijan divided the world between his four sons, the eldest becoming Khan of Eurasia and the great Khan or Kagan of the dynasty. The second taking the Americas, the third Africa, and his youngest son Timur was bequeathed Australia, Oceania, Australasia. Timur's forces made landfall in Darwin, in the Northern Territory, and rapidly moved southward. 
seizing the abundant Australian grasslands and founding the Connate's capital of Ik Kulon, in the northern portion of Western Australia in what is now the Kimberley region, about 300 kilometers south of Derby, more than 1,000 kilometers west of Tennant Creek. Timor II divided the Khanate between his four sons. Kaidar, the eldest, was given the Kiwi Kingdoms, New Zealand. His second son, Chagatai, was sent to wage war against the southwestern face of the continent. His third son sent to the southeast. The youngest, Ilugay, was the protector of the homeland and the de facto regent Nick Kulan. Victory in New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia was swift. Kaidar was chasing New Zealand's forces down the South Island, and the continent held out its last stand at Perth. And for a time it looked like they might hold out. Ilugay had slain his mother the Empress in the north, and had proclaimed himself Khan in a mock ceremony and Chagatai entered into open rebellion against his brother, splitting his forces between the walls of Perth and a forced march through the desert to Ikulan. He left his best general and his 12-year-old son to face the concentrated might of the Australian armed forces. In the end, the fall of Perth was decided by Minister Marcellus Goodman, who made a deal with General Jahangir to open the gates if his granddaughter Valerie was wed into the royal family and made a princess consort. The gates were opened in the night, Chief of the Defense Force General Stalin is poisoned, and anarchy runs rampant throughout the streets of Perth. Much of the surviving armed forces flee into the Indian Ocean. Prince Hulagu is sworn in as the Prefect of the Southwest, takes his bride, and the last holdout of the modern age is brought to an end. Prince Chagatai, meanwhile, joins forces with his brother in New Zealand, and Ilugay Khan is quickly brought to an end as well, slain in his own bedchamber in the night by Prince Amur, Kaidar's eldest. Chagatai calls a Kuraltai, where he is himself proclaimed Khan of Australia. The Hounds of Harajan is an epic story of intrigue, mysticism, assassination, war, and what it means to live under a conquering dynasty. And concubines. Lots and lots of concubines. It is set to be released in the spring of 2016. In August of this year, you can look forward to the release of The Conquest of Concor Kane, a novella set in that same world about a femme fatale assassin going after a corrupt Mongol tax collector in New Zealand which is going to be released as an audio novella, completely for free. For more information, you can check out the website www.harijanshounds.com, where you can find that novella, The Conquest of Concord Kane. Or you can go to my author's website, www.jasonmshannon.com.